my best to give, do that for you if you do your best to receive it. Amen? Amen. You remember what, uh, what psalm that we preached out of last week? Psalm it was Psalm 2. Psalm 2.12 said, kiss the son, lest he be angry. You remember that? Yeah. What an interesting thought. I just come from a wedding yesterday. How many of you came from a wedding yesterday in Houston? Wasn't that a blessing? Oh, yeah. Man, powerful. The presence of the Lord was there, right? His word was on display. It was actually a demonstration of actually an actual biblical layout of what a, uh, an approach to an altar and a marriage could look like or should look like. Amen? Yeah. That's always a good opportunity uh, to see that and participate in that. Um, what, what, what happens right before, like right before the bride and groom are off, pronounced man and wife and move on? What's the last thing traditionally that's done? They kiss the bride. Why wait for last? I mean, good Lord. Right? There's anticipations there. Just come and kiss me now. No, there's a reason. Kiss the son lest he be angry. I would think in a moment like you, many of you have participated in weddings, and, and I don't know if you've been part of one of these. I never have yet, and I hope that I wouldn't be. But you get to a wedding. You're participating and watching, and the bride and groom come together, and the, and the, groom, the groom goes to kiss the bride, and, and well, she doesn't really engage. Oh. 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 <laughs> I don't know how I'd feel in that moment. I might be angry. I'm, I'm definitely going to be a lot of things if I am he. Would you, man? Yeah. <laughs> You're like, and she leaves you hanging. You're like, oh. Yeah. See, King Yeshua, I think, is puckering up, but not everybody's responding. Last week's message was to remind you that in the eyes of God, you are God's consecrated ones, God's holy ones. Do you remember that? The one that God sought out, right, to initiate a relationship that would ultimately lead you to what would look like a marriage ceremony with his son. Can we get on board and get a little biblical today? Revelation 19, 6 says this. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude. People working the slides, if that scripture is not in there for you, I don't want you to plug scripture in where there is none. There's a reason that I'm not putting everything on the screen today. Amen. Amen. Revelation 19, 6. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, hallelujah, for the Lord God almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready. Today's message, I want to be clear with you, is aimed at that tension that we all feel when we say that we are married to Yeshua, married to Jesus, but we find ourselves lacking in our commitment to him. Are you married to Jesus? Or are you engaged in waiting to be married to him? You see, this is what I want to correct in our theology today, in our bibliology today and yes that's a word somebody said it I don't say it a whole bunch so now it's been said I invent a lot of words no doubt about that that one I did not but the more important question I want you to answer today in and of yourself is are you fully engaged no matter what that answer is no matter whether you find yourself in the engagement process with Jesus or actually married to him. Whatever the Bible says, the important question is, are you fully engaged today? Yeah. Today's message is fully engaged. Are you with me? Yeah. Today I want to walk you through the biblical Jewish engagement period to help you understand that Yeshua is a man of his word. Yeah. And if Yeshua is a man of his word, what do you think you ought to be? Today, I want to help you simplify. I want to help you kiss it. So that you might find yourself fully engaged at all time. Can we do that? Yeah. Friends, the ancient biblical Jewish wedding was exhilarating. It was life-giving. And it was also heart-wrenching. 
And it was also a process. And I want you to understand that. We're kind of one and done people today. Right? I met you. I kissed you. Good. We can live together as married. Whatever. Right? Because we love instant gratification, but we don't love a process. Because a process really works things out of your heart, and you're, you prefer not to do that part. Mm. As we walk through the word today, many of you are going to see that we have gotten many things right, but also many things wrong, many things backwards, many things out of place. But the Bible helps you to put things in right order no matter where you find yourself today. Amen. Amen. Others of you are going to recognize that although you may have gotten some things wrong or some things out of order, your commitment level, every one of us is in need of recalibration. And the rare few of you in this room who find your lives perfectly in biblical order will appreciate the word of God still challenging you to become even more fully engaged. There's a three-part process to the biblical marriage that I'm going to share with you today. I got a slide for that. We're going to work through this today. The first process is about The commencement. Say commencement. Commencement. The second one is about the commitment. Commitment. Say commitment. Commitment. And the third is about the consummation. The entirety of the process of a marriage to the the Lamb of God has a three-part process, and you're going to need to ask yourself, where are you at in that process? To kiss this for you for a minute, to make it a little more simple for you, I want to walk you through a couple little, a little more explanation uh, that I have for this. You got the next slide. To become fully engaged, there's three parts to this actual process. Now, the spellings here are debatable, but these are ours today. This is the shidushin, shid, shidushin, shidushin, there it is, I forgot that sheen. Shidushin, that K can be a, a C as well. Shidushin. Somebody else over. Say it with me. Shidushin. Thank you. Kidushin. Nesween. Now we all got it wrong or we all got it right. So. And I'm going to say that slow so I don't cuss at you. The Shidushin. The Kidushin. And the Nesween. Keep on moving on. We can get back to English here. Right? The Shidushin is. Where the husband initiates a promise. Then what happens next is that promise is reciprocated by the one that the husband approaches. And then what happens next after that is that promise that was given in the beginning when the promise is initiated now becomes a reality. And this is the process in which you live inside of right now. We're going to help you. Help tell you where exactly you're at before the day is done. Move on. I think I got another slide. Becoming fully engaged has to do with participating fully in this process and not giving up before the end. This is where they meet. This is getting a little more like, okay, yeah, this, I understand this. this is where we meet. We greet. We say, hey, what's up? I like you. You pretty. <laughs> but then something happens in the relationship as it grows. You go from that. To getting engaged. We, we call this, this period an engagement period. From that point on, there is then an actual marriage ceremony. And we all recognize this in our traditions. Some of this is like, yeah, we get this. We know this. Why are you even telling me about this this morning? It's going to change for you biblically. And you're going to understand some of the things that we've gotten out of place and put them in right order this morning that we might have to shalom and peace of God. Amen. Yes. Amen. Is there another slide? That's the, is it the last one? Uh, there's actually six. Is five. Hey, amen. Becoming fully engaged in this process is where the husband proposes. Any of you been in that situation before? But after that, in this next part, which we call the betrothal period, this is where it changes for us. It seems backwards on the screen, but it's not. And this is the point that I want to make, with, make to you this morning. Biblically speaking, after he proposes, what comes next in the Kedushin is legally binding in the Jewish community. Like, how many of you have been engaged? 
right? So during that engagement period, at that moment, were, were you fully married or was that like the beginning of something to come? Like you, so then you put, you put into your culture a quit option in between because, well, I mean, we're just trying each other out. You see, they didn't do that. The Bible doesn't do that. God doesn't do that to you. Yeshua didn't do that to you. In the Kedushin, in this process, in the betrothal process, they get legally married. And then from that point, they live for a time in that period without actually getting the benefits of that, full benefits of that marriage. Nevertheless, in their heart and their mind, it's as good as done. Because in that swing process that's coming, they at that point and only at that point do they get to experience what they vowed in the first place. Last one. Becoming fully engaged starts with the commencement. It then moves on to a commitment and then ends in a new beginning. We call the consummation. Can I walk you through this for a minute? This morning, for a few minutes this morning. Amen. If you're tired in this place, this is not the day. You are welcome to hit your reset on your butt clock anytime. Stand up because you don't want to miss a piece of this this morning. Amen. I want to start with you this morning by the commencement. Turn to Genesis 24 with me. As we walk through the commencement. Back up to that slide for a minute. In the Shedushin, you're going to learn that mutual agreement is everything. Everything. And you actually get the opportunity from Yeshua himself to reciprocate what he actually poured out to you first. In Genesis 24, you're going to see that these things are already happening before traditionally this community of people actually put it down on paper and in to writing. But you're going to see it already at work, and I want to show you that today. And we're going to use Genesis 24 as a wineskin to express to you the reality of what you're living in. And the men of God who love the Lord and have been following him for a long time have been as well. Genesis 24, verse 1, are you there? Now Abraham was very old. And the Lord had blessed him in every way. Abraham's the father of our faith. Amen. Amen. And he said to the senior servant in his household, the one in charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh. I want you to swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I am living, but will go to my country and my own relatives and get a wife For my son, Isaac. All of you are very aware of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. You all understand this because you're very biblically literate and read these things day in and day out. So I'm not going to have to express to you all the back work that we just walked into. Everybody understands Abraham. Amen? Amen. Every ancient Jewish marriage started. Somebody say started. Started. When a father saw that the time had come for his son to be joined to the one that would be his forever helper in the carrying out of the will of God on his life. Yes, the responsibility to choose a bride fell on the father, not the son. That means the relationship between Abraham and Isaac is a model of what any godly home is aiming for and Abraham and Isaac's relationship set the example for how a biblical Jewish wedding would commence. Some of you are already having problem because of the culture you raised up in said, it's my choice, not my father's choice. Are you talking about arranged marriages? Yes. (laughs) Are we telling you you should have an arranged marriage? Yes. It should be arranged by the Holy Spirit. First and foremost, initiated by the father. Somebody just had a sigh of relief. (laughs) 
Friends, if you remember, both Abraham and Isaac's relationship would be tested just two chapters back in Genesis 22. Do you remember? When God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son on the altar and Isaac to entrust himself to the father's hands. Wow. Both in that time would receive the revelation of the substitutionary sacrifice, the ram of God whose horns were caught in the thicket and became the sacrifice instead of Isaac. Do you remember that story? Well, that's important to understand the mutual relationship that Abraham and Isaac had towards one another. They mutually loved one another. They mutually trusted one another. And when those things are perfectly in place, of course your father could choose your bride for you. But we don't live in that reality, do we? And if we don't live in that reality, which one do we? It's either light or it's either darkness. These acts that we found between Abraham and Isaac, acts of obedience, would show us what was necessary for a father and son to both be involved in the situation, much like a father being responsible for choosing a bride for his son and the son entrusting his father's discernment. Mutual love. Somebody say mutual love. Mutual love. Wow. To know one another's intentions, to know and understand one another's wills, to be intimately involved in their wants. This is what Abraham and Isaac lived in. This is what the father and son participated in. Their desires and their aims in life had to be one so that the relationships chosen would be righteous. Wow. Wow. Because the generations depended on it, didn't it, Abraham? This is the culture that God built into Abraham's family, and it's a culture that he can build into yours. Isaac would have spent his entire life confiding in his father, and his father would have spent his entire life investing in Isaac's best interest. And both would have fully had themselves entrusted to one another. In order when these times come, then the choice would be of God. Every Shidushin starts with the father knowing the son and the son knowing the father. Doesn't that remind you of John 10, 29? I and my father are one. Every Shidushin involves a father watching for the time to come when his son who has been preparing his entire life, is ready to become fully engaged with the bride. He raised the son. He watched the son. He invested in the son. And when the time was come, he said, son, it's time. Go find your bride. Wow. Mark 13, 32 says, but on that day and hour, no one knows the time. Not even the angels heaven, not even the son, but only the father. Could you imagine being raised in the father's house? You feel like you're ready, but he didn't say so yet. And then all of a sudden, you're finally, you're finally focused on the Father's will. And, he's, and one day he comes up, he's like, it's time. And you're like, really? It's time? I didn't know that. Thank you, Father, for telling me. Wow. Every Jewish wedding process started like this. It started just like the relationship That started with you between you and King Jesus. At just the right time, set by the Father, the Holy Spirit was sent out to seek and search for someone who was willing to say yes to the dress. (laughs) Do you remember? John the Baptist picked up on this when he said this in John 3.27. To this, John replied, a person can receive only what is given from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said I'm not the Messiah, but I am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. The joy is mine. Watch this. And John says, and is now complete. What's complete? The Shadushin is complete. Not the whole thing. The beginning starts. The bridegroom has arrived. The Shedushin has begun. begun. In the Shedushin process, as the prospective bride was approached, there would be requirements 
that must be met. Oh, you, you're already thinking like men are like, there's some requirements that must be met for my bride, too. Well, guess what? The requirements weren't looks. The requirements weren't positions. The requirements weren't perfection. The one requirement just to even approach was willingness. Willingness. The father sent out a messenger looking for the son, and he was looking for one thing. I don't even want to get go further unless the first thing I see is willingness. Wow. Many view biblical arranged marriages as forced, but that's a misconception. Just like you, you read the word slave and you think slave in the culture that you've been in, when you think marriage, the one arranged in the family, you, your lens is wrong. You must take it off. When it was time for Isaac that, by the way, uh, Galatians 4.28 says, represented a promised son. When it was time for him to be wed, it was his father that knew the time. And it was his father that initiated the process. And then he turned, and you see here in Genesis 24, to what says the senior servant. If you were to read, if you were to read Genesis 15 too, it tells you that that senior servant's name was Eleazar. Yeah. Y'all remember what Eleazar's name meant? God the helper. To go and find a bride, he is sent on behalf of the father to find the son a bride. Wow, that, re that reminds me of John 14, 26. But God the helper, the Holy Spirit, who the father sent, will teach you all things. Abraham, being old in age, the scripture says, which reminds me like the ancient of days, sent Eleazar, God the helper, to find a bride for his promised son to marry. And Ele Eleazar asked this question in verse 5. The servant asked him, Eleazar asked him, what if the woman is unwilling to come back with me to this land? Shall I then take your son back to the country you came from? Look what he says in verse 6. Make sure you don't do that. Make sure that you do not take her back and meet my son. Don't do it. Abraham, the father, was certain that there would be a bride for his son, but the bride must be willing or else the invitation is off. The process never even begins. That's important. Because if you've been unwilling since the day that you were invited and you're still unwilling today, you have not moved forward in this process and you called yourself married and you are not. Every Shedushin was marked by a few important factors that I want to help you clarify this morning. Can I do that? Yes. Shedushin is the very first step in becoming fully engaged. Somebody say fully engaged. fully engaged. Fully engaged and refers to the preliminary agreements prior to a legal betrothal. That means at this point, nothing's legal. The very first thing, husbands need to be sent by the father. And the bride to be must be found willing. Wow. That reminds me of John 12, 49. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the father who sent me has himself given me a commandment. What to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandments is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say, as the father has told me. Wow. You know, ladies, when you get a godly husband because he's a godly representation, it has been sent by the father. Yeah. Once a willing bride to be was found, the father and the to be husband would begin to arrange something called a ketubah. How many of you have been in marriage counseling with us? Yeah. How many of you remember what a ketubah is? 
I got a slide for that just to help you through that because we're not going to camp on this today. Do you have a, that'll work. How about the next one? A ketubah was actually, it actually contained something. And it started in this very first process. And if we couldn't get past this, we couldn't get to the next step. Are you ready? Yes, we're ready. In this process, this was where you learned that mutual promise, that mutual agreement. It reminds me of 1 John 5, 3, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. Friends, like a husband, Yeshua came with his father's Torah commands in hand. They were already written, and it's what he showed up as the bridegroom. In a Jewish wedding, the ketubah would be a written document that was originated by the father, carried by the son in hand with his son's heart and love in mind. To the prospect bride, if, somebody say if, she accepted the invitation into the relationship. This is what it would actually state. Within the ketubah would be a promise, a provision, and a procreation. Many of you understand this as written words. In a ketubah, it would be made up of written words, actual money given, and sex. All that came together in this ketubah. It was a promise from the husband to the bride that says, I promise and I'm willing to put it down in writing. Do you you follow me? I promise to treat you like God and I'm willing to put it in writing because I am a man of my word. And these words will testify against me if my actions say otherwise. In that ketubah would also be the provision. He would actually give money. For what? It was an actual insurance that if I back out on you, bride, you will still be provided for. Wow. And what else? Procreation. Sex. Sex is for marriage. And the reason that we hold it and sanctify it for that is because it is precious and it's speaking a loud message. The husband is saying, I will not be in this for my personal gain. I will help you to multiply and produce godly image and offspring so that we together can fulfill the Genesis mandate on our life. It wasn't just for the husband to satisfy his needs. It was for him to give us a gift to his wife. Inside that ketubah was a promise, a provision, and a procreation clause that he gave to the wife and didn't ask her to respond. He just said, this is what I'm going to do. Friends, when a father sent a son, they would go together with one another and show up at the prospective bride's home. Watch this. He would knock on the door. And then he would wait because the bride to be had already been forewarned by messengers like John before Yeshua. If you open the door, you're accepting invitation for me to come in. Revelation 3.20 says it like this. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and he opens the door. Then I will come in and eat with him and he will be with me. Mm. Friends, once the young lady let the bridegroom to be in, he would present her with a cup of wine. He showed up with a cup of wine. And if she would drink from the same cup that he did, it indicated that she was willing to accept the terms of the Shadushim. Mark 10, 35. You remember that? It says that Yeshua himself was seated. The disciples asked Yeshua, could we set at your right hand and your left hand? What did Yeshua say? You don't know what you ask, but indeed you will drink from the same cup as me. To just receive the invitation, you have to be willing to drink the same cup as your bridegroom. After this, 
the man or the men in the family would sit down. They would haggle over the terms of the ketubah. And when they were done, two witnesses would sign it. They would drink the two cups together in celebration and present the ketubah to the bride. Watch this to be a gift to her. The husband gave it away. It now belonged to the bride. It was a gift to her and now her possession. She now owned it. She owned the promise. She received the promise. And when she received the promise, she owned the promise. And you know what it was? uh, One of the reasons it was given to cure her from her insecurities that would most definitely arise once she said yes to the invitation. Many of you brides in here have been in that place. Like I said, yes, I'm not really sure whether he'll fulfill his promise. Wow. Something very important for you to know is that the ketubah was a one-way contract in writing from the man to the woman. One way. Meaning the bridegroom would state his promises to her and give it to her as a gift. Her part was to truly receive what he said he was to her. When she accepted it, it was her possession for the entire message, uh, for an entire marriage. This completed the Shedushin process. That means the opportunity for mutual agreement that would never be renegotiated again had come and it's gone. The time for negotiations were over. Have you received the invitation from Yeshua? Have you renegotiated during times after that? It's a legal violation, and that's why you feel the way you do. Friends, this ended the commencement and gave way to the commitment. Somebody say commitment. But before we move on, I want to ask you a few questions. Did you choose him or he chose you? According to the scripture, he chose you. When you make your agreements with one another, with people that you love, or Yeshua himself, Is it your culture to constantly renegotiate what you've agreed to when you received the other person's affection or their companionship or their love or the personal benefits that come with that? You receive it, but then you renegotiate the agreement that you did so long ago. Is that your culture? Because it's not kingdom culture. The reason the the ketubah was a one way promise is because it was not contingent on the good character of the bride it was contingent in saying of the husband this is my character no matter how you act this is who I am my I don't change according to your performance this is just who I am so I have no problem with giving you a one-way contract because I don't move I don't change it's who I am and it's who I will always be When I am faithful and you're unfaithful, I still remain faithful. When he came to the door, this bridegroom, and knocked, did you let him in? Or is he still knocking? If you let him in, when he asked you to drink from the same cup that he drank from, are you still resisting? Because in a Jewish wedding process, if she were not willing to open the door or not willing to drink from the same cup that he would drink from, then the invitation was off. Friends, Yeshua loves you. That's been made clear here in this house. He would not have shown up in your life if that was not so. But to be fully engaged, your love must exceed the willingness of Abraham and Isaac. Your love must exceed men like that. It must be mutual. And his commands must not feel burdensome. Friends, none of you are involved in a Jewish wedding right now, but every one of you are in the process of becoming fully engaged. Somebody say fully engaged. engaged. And that's why even as we speak, You can sense the Holy Spirit already starting to make my words relevant to you. Friends, the first step to becoming fully engaged to the bridegroom was commencement. But the second stage in this process from Shedushin 
from commencement is commitment. Let's tell you a little bit about the commitment. You know that big word. It's a bit of a cuss word in our time. From the Shedushin, you moved on to the Kedushin. In modern days, some of them call it a Rusian, but that's another story for another day. We call it the betrothal. We understand that word very well. This is actually the, the process and the place for the bride-to-be to be able to show herself faithful to the promise that was given her. She's now confronted with the promise, and it's in her hand. But now it's her opportunity to reciprocate and let that process confront her heart and tell her whether she's actually as faithful as the one who proposed to her. We see this in Genesis 24, 10, where it says, Then the servant took ten of his master's camels and departed. I love that. When I, say, when I see the word ten, I think of the commandments. Taking all sorts of choice gifts from his master. And he arose and he went to Mesopotamia to a city called Nahor. And he made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at a time of evening. And the time went when women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. Behold, I am standing by the spring of water and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Let the young women to whom I say, please let down your jar that I might drink. And who shall say back to me, drink and I will water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have appointed to your servant Isaac. Can you see the operation of the Holy Spirit here? By this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to your master. Before he had finished speaking, behold, Rebecca. Oh, Rebecca. Who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother. And she came out with her water jaw on her shoulder. Come on, ladies, y'all got to start to. Uh, I don't want to preach today. I got too much to cover. <laughs> Every woman of God's found with a jar on her shoulder. In the commencement of the Shedushin, it started with the man, but ended with both he and the young lady in mutual agreement to move forward. In the time of the Kedushin, the weight of the responsibility is now equally on the bridegroom and the bride-to-be. Before a young Jewish woman could be married to any man, she had to become committed to serving in her home. That would look like many things, like everyday chores, to learning to be a wife, to participating in the family farm or the family business. At the same time, without ceasing, to draw water from the well to bring refreshment to others, without complaint. These types of chores would help her develop a servant's heart while she waited for God's helper to show up and catch her being faithfully committed to the demands of everyday life rather than looking for contentment elsewhere. Some ladies in the house just said, okay, now life makes sense. Ladies, you're going to want to be found drawing water at the well with a content heart and without complaint at the place you would call home if you want God to send a suitor. Behold, Rebecca, that's a big statement. Could it be? Could she be the one? Would she be willing? Is it? Oh, man, I hope so. Maybe. I don't know. When the right heart is present in God's right time, divine unions occur. Friends, being fully committed to what God has given now puts you in a right place at the right time for more to come. Verse 16 says it like this. The young woman was very attractive in appearance and a maiden whom no man had known. She went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, please, please give me a little water to drink from your jar. She said, drink, my Lord. And she quickly let down her jar, her hand, and she gave him a drink. When she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels, too. 
Hmm. Until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar in, in to the trough and ran again to the well to draw water again. And she also drew it for the camels. The man gazed at her in silence. <laughs> she, she shut my mouth. That's what happens to me when I look at Miss Jen over there. I'm like, Phew. I'm a little lost for words. The man gazed at her in silence and learned whether the Lord had prospered his journey or not. That makes me think of 2 Corinthians 8 when it says, And here is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to be to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what you have, not what you don't have. Wow. Friends, I believe Eleazar saw Rebecca. He perceived her as a prospect, but needed a moment to discern whether or not he was seeing When he looked at her, was a person who was serving because she was told to or because she desired to? Who wants to be married to a woman who thinks the Lord's commands are burdensome? You know what will happen with that? She'll think her husband's commands are burdensome as well. Rebecca was beautiful on the outside, but Eliezer wanted to see whether she was ugly on the inside. What was Eliezer looking for? He wasn't listening. He was looking for actions. Wow. Would she produce what she preached? I believe that when she went beyond what he had asked of her and watered his camels as well, that he knew that he had found the one that the son could learn to fall in love with. Are you with me this morning? Friends, Jesus is not looking for to marry a minimalist. That's true. That's true. Someone who is living to just do what it takes to stay engaged. He is looking for someone who sees the minimum requirements as a fantastic place to start. This was Rebecca. And this is the kind of bride Yeshua deserves. Friend, the Kedushin is the betrothal process which is about to start for Rebecca. It is where the commencement ends and the commitment begins. You guys feel that all the time, don't you? You call this the engagement process, but there, it looks a lot different for you, and I'm going to help you with that this morning. Are you ready? Yeah. Their betrothal time was actually as binding as marriage because their hearts and minds, in their hearts and minds, were no turning back. When they committed, they aim, and in their heart, they were absolutely going to carry out what they committed to. Friend, God is a person of his word. The father is a person of his word. And the bridegroom is a man of his word. And if the bridegroom was a man of his word, which he was willing to put in writing just to start being intentional with his bride, then the expectation was set for the bride to be a person of her word. So why make it legally binding? Remember, the betrothal process started after willingness was found and after legal binding process, uh, promises coming from the father's house had been given. But during the Kedushin, the bride to be had the opportunity to put her words into action to prove to herself and to her bridegroom that whether she was going to be truthful and authentic. It was an opportunity for you to become real with yourself. Instead of just being a person of words, you would become a faithful person in your actions. Friends, this is what it looked like when it came for Rebecca in verse 22. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took out a gold ring weighing a a becca. And two gold bracelets weighing 10 shekels. Then he asked, 
whose daughter are you? <laughs> it's like, who are you? Please tell me, is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? Wow, he's testing her. She answered him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, born to Nahor. And she added, we have plenty of straw and fodder and well, as well as room for you to spend the night. Then the man bowed down and worshiped the Lord, saying, praise the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not abandoned his kindness and faithfulness to my master. As for me, the Lord has led me on the journey to the house of my master's relatives. I love the imagery here. Eleazar, God's helper, gives an invitation into betrothal by piercing Rebecca with gold and wrapping her with gifts. In the Kedushin stage, the bridegroom would actually take the bride to be to the city gates. Listen to me. Where the elders, the judges and the community would gather and give her something of value together with the ketubah that he had presented. He required nothing of value in return from her because if he did, then it would cancel out it being a gift to her. In fact, he needed nothing in return because she was his reward. And her unwavering commitment to the relationship was the only thing he found of value that she could actually give back. Friends, married couples, remember that on the day that your feelings tell you. You ever been there, right? You're married and been that way a long time, but you get into those places where your feelings are telling you something about your spouse that may or may not be true. I want you to remember that on that day, your feelings tell you that you no longer you're no longer loved. He's no longer committed. Friends, if he's faithfully standing in front of you, he loves you. Because he's still there. Love's not a feeling. It's a commitment over time called faithfulness. The feelings will follow. Be careful that in those moments that you're not tempted to become the one who is unfaithful in how you feel about the one still standing in front of you. Friends, if he's still standing in front of you, ladies, He's being faithful. And in that moment, you have an opportunity for you to be unfaithful in your heart. Or you can remain faithful to the promise that was given in the first place. You're still here. Praise God. God can help us. Eleazar asked, who are you? And will you make room for me in your home? (laughs) No, Holy Spirit asks you that at times, like all the time. Friends, Rebecca would have known exactly what was happening because of their shared customs. And what she would say next would signify a willing commitment to leave everything she had ever known for a bridegroom that she had never met into a life that was unknown and the cost was unspoken. Friends, the difference between the Shedushin and the Kedushin is tangible commitment. It's where it goes from words to actions in in your everyday life forever. Everyone says that they're committed. Everyone loves to say, I promise. But it's those who are fully engaged that prove it by what they do next. The Kedushim was the time to put your money where your mouth was, to put practice to what you preach, to own those amens that I hear in this place. In verse 50, Laban and Bethuel, the men of her house, said this, this is from the Lord. We can say nothing to the one, to one way or the other. Here is Rebecca. Take her and go and let her become the wife of your master's son, as the Lord had directed. When Abraham's servant heard what they had said, he bowed down to the ground before the Lord. Then the servant brought out gold and silver, jewelry and articles of clothing and gave them to Rebecca. Do you see this, saints? He had already presented a proposal to her when he put a ring in her nose. 
But now he's given additional gifts. Man, have you received additional gifts upon the invitation, saints? He also gave costly gifts to the brother and mother. How many of you have been a blessing to your extended family? The gift of God's given in you is now a blessing to them even when you come around. Then he and the men who were with him ate and drank and spent the night together. And when they got up the next morning, he said, send me on my way to my master. I got the bride. I'm going to bring her back to my master. This Kedushin started when the two witnesses who were just men like Laban and Bethuel signed the Ketubah before many witnesses and the bridegroom gave gifts to the bride. Friends, this is where the relational process that had lifelong ramifications would stop being about contract and become about commitment. Have you been challenged by the Holy Spirit to stop relating to Yeshua just on the rigid religious letter of the law? the contractual relationship and move on into commitment of heart prove by your everyday actions. Some of you read the word and went, man, I need to get saved. You asked him and then he did. And after that, you've been holding right to his letter of the law, but never really relating to him about why he wrote what he did. Do you know how you will act moving forward? Because he's interested in that. Friends, when you stop waiting on your feelings to give you permission to stay committed to what God has already told you, you'll probably, you may be there. When you serve him, even when you cannot feel him in the room, you're there. When you do his commands because you love that those commands came from him. When you become like him in his absence because you care about his presence being on display when he's not here. Because you are committed to the cause of Christ as much as he is committed to you. Friends, if he can't be there, don't you want him to be on display? And that's why he left you there. A bride is a representation of the bridegroom. And if you love him. He doesn't have to be there. He can be seen because you're there. Friends, in a Jewish wedding, during this time of betrothal, the groom would give good gifts and begin this new stage of relationship by saying to the bride these words. Are you ready? These are the words that are said during this Kedushin, during the, the betrothal. It would start like this. The husband would say, behold, by this ring that I give you, You are my consecrated one. I consecrate you to be my wife according to the law of Moses of Israel. Wow. Friends, what are you consecrated for? You got to kiss it. You got to keep it simple, saints. What are you consecrated for? It's to be betrothed unto marriage. You are consecrated and set apart as the bride to be married. Up to this point, it probably sounds a lot like the engagement days that you have participated in, but it is not. You know why? What happens next? In the Jewish community, this couple was now, when a man gets down and he puts a ring on it, at that point, it's legally binding. That doesn't happen in our time, does it? And it puts some clauses into our culture that may not be God, And then we take our freedom and use it for sin. Dylan Hutchinson, you were married when you got engaged to Alyssa or you had to wait a little bit. Hmm. Christopher, you're engaged. Friend, are you married? Oh, wow. But are you as committed as you are? Are you just as committed today? It is as good as done. Or do you have a quick clause in your engagement? Hmm. Both bridegroom and bride-to-be were now to be exclusively set apart for one another only. But, somebody say but. They were forbidden to live in the same home and sometime in the same city together for about a year. 
They were not allowed to sleep together for about that time. Until that time. And the bridegroom would actually leave the bride for about a year, watch this, to focus on going and building an addition onto his father's house. Wow. That reminds me of John 14, 1, which said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, also believe in me. In my father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I... I have gone to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself. That where I am, you would be also. He promised that. Do you believe him? Friends, do you doubt him? This Kedushim betrothal period was so binding that if the husband died before the wedding came, the wife would still receive the inheritance. Let me ask you a question. In your mind, was there a point where Yeshua himself died before the wedding supper of the Lamb? Then why do you question the fact of whether you received his inheritance yet or not? And guess what the bride had to do while she was waiting? She spent the rest of her time that she had Preparing for the wedding day. And how did she do so? I love it. It reminds me of John 6, 28. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the work of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe on the one he sent. That you believe on the promise that he showed up with. And if you believed it, you would see it in your preparations. But not if you think you're married already. She learned to be committed. Somebody say committed. She learned to be committed to what she had agreed to. This is what would make her ready for her wedding day to the one that she had already legally been bound to and said, I do to. Mark 2, 19. And Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. He's on the planet at that time. But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast on that day. Friends, what is fasting to you? It's consecrating yourself and setting yourself apart for a time and for a purpose. When you fast, you consecrate yourself for a time. You set yourself apart in a special way for a special purpose. When Yeshua was With his bride-to-be, they had no need to set themselves apart for him because they were with him, but he left them, and he said, when that happened, then they and the maidens would fast. They would consecrate themselves. Friend, like an Isaiah 58 type style, not not a hunger strike for Jesus, but a lifetime set apart and consecrated for him. He was saying, I am the bridegroom, making it clear. My disciples are the bride to be, and they have an opportunity to consecrate themselves until my return. And what would that consecration look like? Commitment. Friends, you live in a society that dates churches, never get rooted nor grounded. In your mind, you're already saying, I might be here forever or not, because you're not committed like the betrothed was committed. Matthew 24, 12 says this, and because of lawlessness, Torahlessness, this society would begin to erupt. It would be increased, and the love of most will grow cold. You already live in that environment. Don't you think it's coming? It's here. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be Proclaimed throughout the whole earth as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Friend, in the end, Yeshua's bride will be wearing a veil that says, I am faithful. Have you ever been to a marriage and somebody got cold feet and the groom is standing there, but the bride doesn't show up? Do you think that for some reason that's what the wedding supper of the lamb is going to look like? No. No. He's going to make absolutely sure that his bride shows up 
You need to make absolutely sure that you are her. Genesis 24, 54. Then he and the men who were with him ate and drank and spent the night together. And when they got up the, the next morning, he said, send me on my way to my master. Verse 55. But her brother and her mother replied, let the young women remain with us for 10 days or so. Then you may go. <laughs> but he said to them, do not detain me. Now that the Lord has granted success on my journey. Send me on my way so that I might go to my master. Then they said, let's call the young woman and ask her. Will you go with this man, they asked. Friends, the first thing that every believer will deal with once you have made your betrothal commitment to Yeshua is being challenged by the closest people in your life of how quickly or radically you should or should not obey. Don't follow Jesus that way. Why? That's how I follow him. No, thank you. Follow him at the same pace that I do or actually don't. Live your life married to mediocrity like me. Let me remind you of Luke 9, 57. The words of Yeshua himself, the bridegroom. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. That has to be the voice of a bride. I'll follow my husband wherever he goes. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. To another, he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. That's legitimate. Let me first go and to the funeral of my father. Jesus said to them, let the dead bury the dead. But as for you, go and proclaim my kingdom. Go and tell them the wedding supper of the lambs on his way. <laughs> Dang. Friends, the Kedushin or the betrothal time is a promise to get married, but you are not yet married. And everything in this world is going to fight to make you abort and follow through on what you said you would do. This time is the time that every believer, every believer must aim to be fully engaged, but must demonstrate faithfulness. And the Jewish people took this more seriously than the marriage ceremony to come. So much so that you had to seek, watch this, the council of the Torah or the uh, council of the law to receive what they called a get, a divorce. If you wanted to back out on the engagement. I wonder how many marriages would have been saved if our society was built upon the same convictions. Instead of trying one another out. I got a daughter in here. I got to tell you, a man of God's going to come along. He ain't going to try her out. He's either going to know she is or isn't. Because, because she's not going to learn a culture of some man coming to try her out. He's going to know she's the one. And he's willing to put in the hard work. Matthew 26, 26. Now, as they were eating, Yeshua took the bread and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples. And he said, take and eat. This is my body. And he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many and for the forgiveness of sins. And I tell you, I will not drink it again. I will not drink again the fruit of the vine until the day which I drink it anew in my father's kingdom where I went to build the house. Friends, another thing that happened during this betrothal, Kedushin time, Kedushin time, Kedushin time, before the bridegroom left is that the bridegroom would drink from the third cup of wine in this process, just like Yeshua did at his Kedushin, with his prospects. He said that he was committed to refraining from drinking because he had work to do. He had to go and build your house. 
Deuteronomy 24 speaks to this when it says in verse 5, when a man is newly married, he shall not go out with the army or be charged with any related duty. He shall be free at home for one year to be happy with his wife whom he has married. You go back and study that. You're thinking at the day that they consummated the marriage. It was the day of the betrothal. They didn't take off work. They worked twice as hard a year before because they knew during that foundational year they needed to be fully available for setting the foundation of what was forever. Double the work, single men. Double the work. Double it. Somebody say double it. You're a single man in here. Say, I'm going to double it. Wow. Wow. Saints, when the bridegroom finally left to go and build a house unto the father's house for he and his bride to be, the bride was left waiting eagerly and patiently on the one who came in and called her his own. Could you imagine the testing that would ensue in that waiting period? Could you imagine? He proposes to her, he betroths her, and then he leaves Like he's not around. You don't see his face. You don't get to hang out with his sweet fellowship. You don't get to get lunch and get to know each other. Nah, it's done. Could you imagine the heart-wrenching process in this moment? It's testing you. It's sifting you. You didn't know those feelings were there. He promised me everything and then he left me. Rejection. Manufactured lies. But he left me to go and prepare. He said he's going to prepare a house for me. It's a testing of your faith. Do you trust him? Will he even come back for me? He didn't even kiss me goodbye. Doubt. Nobody deals with doubt in here, do they? Is he really committed to me? Am I really committed to the promise? Questioning his character at times of your deep introspection. You get deep enough into your heart, you're going to find it's very sinful and in need of cleansing. And then thank the Lord that he gave you a process to work it out before you get to the altar. When you're at the altar and you're looking at each other, when you're looking Yeshua in the eye, he would have already worked all that junk out your heart. And you can confidently say, I do. Give me a kiss. He's a man of his word. After all, I don't really know him that well. But my father does. And he sent him. Second Corinthians 614 says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what participation has the righteous with the lawless? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord does Christ have with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them and I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separated from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then after that, I will welcome you. Betrothal. That long, long, long period of anticipation and preparation. You remember what Ephesians 4.30 says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed. Watch this, for the day of redemption. We say that we're the redeemed, but the truth is you're redeemed on the day that you show up at the altar, the wedding supper of the Lamb. The time of the Kedushim was the time when the couple sealed the deal literally on paper, but the bride-to-be would not be redeemed until the wedding day. Ephesians says you were sealed with what? You were sealed with the Holy Spirit. What's the Holy Spirit? It's the spirit of being set apart. Constantly set apart. The mark of the Holy Spirit is not your ability to speak in tongues or prophesy. The mark of the Spirit is if your life is consistently being set apart for the preparation of your wedding day. 
Ephesians 1.11, in him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be the praise of his glory. He's going to have a radiant bride, saints. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire it as a possession to the praise of his glory. Friends, you did not hear We'll move on. Ephesians 5:25 Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave herself up for her. That He might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water of the word, so that he might present the church to himself as radiant. This is the time you live in, saints. You are being prepared to be radiant, without spot, without wrinkle, that she might be holy without blemish. Friends, you begin with a wedding dress, but you run through mud sometimes. And the Lord knows it. And he's helping you learn how to navigate this time. Are you with me this morning? This time between commencement and consummation was divinely designed for the bride to be in a time of making herself ready by learning to be committed to the promise Yeshua gave her. When she lost hope, she would consult the written promise in her hand, just like you can do with your Bible. When she started to be seduced by other lovers, she could remember the intimate experience of the bridegroom showing up to her home, knocking on the door and her opening the door and they're sipping sweet wine together. All she had to do was be committed to the cause committed to the original promise to endure to the end to be at the altar when it arrived and she was now afforded the time to prepare her heart and her actions to do so (laughs) we live in a cold feet society but that's not kingdom culture and that's not you second corinthians 11 1 i wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness paul says Do bear with me, for I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband. Did I marry you to one husband? No, I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. Friends, you got saved, but you weren't a virgin the day you got saved. The sanctification process makes you that. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunningness, Your thoughts will be led astray from the sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Your commitments. Why not just take her into the bridal chambers during the betrothal, saints? What kind of love prioritizes a house over a bride right now, Yeshua? No. The bride is not ready because those wedding clothes she put on immediately at her betrothal have become dirty during the time of waiting and you're not ready as you should be for the wedding the supper of the lamb because you must learn to become fully engaged yeah. revelation twenty two fourteen: blessed are those who wash the robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life that they might enter the city gates Do you remember Hosea 2.16? And in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband and no longer will you call me my Baal. For I will remove the names of Baal from your mouth. (laughs) That's a lot of Baals flying out of the mouths of the saints. And he's going to clean your mouth before you get to the altar so he can kiss them lips. And they shall be remembered by name no more. And I will, do you hear the promise? I will make for them a covenant on that day with the beast of the field and the birds of the heavens and the creeping things on the ground. And I will abolish the bow and the sword and the war. Everything 
funky in their hearts. Verse 19, and I will betroth, betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness. And you shall know the Lord. You shall die him intimately. And in that day, I will answer, declares the Lord. I will answer the heavens and they shall answer the earth and the earth shall answer the grain and the wine and the oil. And they shall answer Jezreel and I will sow seed into myself, says the Lord. Friends, seed's not sown till the wedding day. And I will have mercy on no mercy. And I will say to not my people, you are my people. And he shall say, you're my God, my God, my God. Friends, when the bridegroom showed up the first time, he had the end goal in mind, but he knew there were no shortcuts if he wanted to receive a bride that was tested and approved. A man of God deserves a wife that's tested and approved, and a wife deserves a man of God who holds firm to his promise, a man of commitment, a, com a man of his word. Friend, the Kedushin time was the long period, like this message, long period. <laughs> Between commencement and consummation that caused you to actually become committed. It caused you and helped you become a committed bride because the road to the altar is narrow and so many have cold feet. But for those who make it, the consummation day, my friends, is yours. Mm -mm -mm. The consummation day. Some of you still waiting, and some of you received it. Man, some things are just sweeter when you wait. Those who wait on the Lord. Mm, come on. How about that consummation? That consummation, in my words, was a nest wing. In the Jewish wedding process, the prospect must be a virgin. That presents a problem for you. In the Jewish wedding process, the prospect must be a virgin. Actually, at the wedding day, the man would take the bride into his chambers, lay her on a white cloth, and consummate the marriage. Then he would exit the tent, and if the cloth had blood on it, the marriage was legit. If not, the marriage was null and void, and the bride was found fraudulent. Because in order for the marriage to be valid, the bride must be pure, and there must be a shedding of blood. Praise God for the bridegroom, Yeshua. I said, praise God for the bridegroom, Yeshua who shed his blood on your behalf of his bride and is actively purifying you and making you like a pure virgin. Friend, as the marriage drew closer, the groom would actually let the word out of the out. He'd let the cat out of the bag that he was near and the bride would begin to prepare herself. You know how she would do so? I got a, a slide called mikvahs. We're not going to teach you on this today because we don't have the time. But a bride was responsible to continuously immerse herself. A mikvah is immersion into water. She would immerse herself in things like repentance, for, for repentance. She would immerse herself in, mix, in mikvahs for the opportunity of ministry, for the opportunity of deep, deeper dedication, for an opportunity for marriage. She would participate in different types of mikvah for the purposes of repentance, ministry, deeper dedication, and marriage. Do you remember that these mikvahs, right, for repentance was the repentance of sins? Ministry was given, right, at the time for power to actually be able to be good for somebody else better than yourselves. You would actually be immersed in times like we are immersed in the body of Christ. Marriage is like being immersed in fire. There's many baptisms, if you would, in your Bible, a baptism for sins, a baptism for power, a baptism into the body of Christ and a baptism in fire. Right. Genesis 24, 61. 
Then Rebekah and her attendants got ready and they mounted those camels and went back with the man. So the servant took Rebekah and left. And now Isaac had come from Bear Lahai Roy, the well of the living one who sees me. That's what that means. Mm, I'm going to preach on that some other time. For he was living in the Negev in the desert. And he went out to the field where he's meditating. And as he looked up, the promised son, he saw those camels approaching. And Rebecca also looked up and saw the promised son. <laughs> and she got down off those camels and asked the servant, who's that man in the field coming to meet? Who is this coming from the east gate? <laughs> He's my master, he said. And the servant answered. So she took her veil and covered herself. And then the servant told Isaac all he had done. And Isaac brought her into his tent of his mother, Sarah. And he married Rebekah. And she became his wife. And they consummated what had been started. Friends, Saints, Genesis... Um, Genesis 24 is an imperfect picture of this ancient Jewish engagement process. This entire engagement process of getting a bride for Isaac. Isaac wasn't even present. Did you see that? But isn't that the same truth that you're living in right now? The father sent the Holy Spirit into your life and has invited you to get fully engaged to his son, even though you don't see him. Isaac didn't, wasn't even present. He trusted his father and he trusted his father's helper. We sing about that, don't we? We sing about being the bride of Christ, but are we? Was Rebecca Isaac's wife before she went into the tent? No, but it was as good as done in that day. She committed to leave her entire life behind and follow Eleazar into the unknown just for the chance of what could be on the other side. Verse 65 says, so she took her veil and covered herself. She took her veil and she covered herself. While the bride-to-be waited for the day of her Nesween, she would wear her wedding dress that included a veil. But on that day, when it was finally time for her to veil, for that veil to be lifted, it was a signification that the consummation was so very close. Wow. Do you remember 2 Corinthians 3, 15? Yes. To the day whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over the hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, Messiah Yeshua, the bridegroom himself, the veil's removed. Now the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there's what? Freedom! And we all with unveiled face behold the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. I think that process from Rebecca's house to meeting Isaac was that process for us. Of learning to be confident enough to lift the veil when the time comes. When the time for the next wean was would draw near the custom for the groomsmen of the bridegroom was to dress up like an army and the bridegroom like a king with a crown and a sword. And they would come like a thief in the night to find the bride who would be eagerly awaiting together with her bridesmaid who would themselves have to be virgins. Because they knew that the bridegroom was trying to surprise them, they figured it would be in the darkest of night, which is around midnight. So they were supposed to keep their lamps burning every night in case that night was the night. When the bridegroom was coming, he would send out his, his groommen to warn them of the coming by having them blow a trumpet. Friends, in your Bible, the trumpets many times are shofars. They will blow a shofar at his coming. When the bride and the bridegroom would make her. When the bride and the bridegroom here at the coming. Would be in that time of preparation. 
the, the bridesmaids would lift the bride into the air on a chair and bring her to the bridegroom. When they met, he would be on the earth and take her back to himself, to his hometown, to be married, just like you see Isaac and Rebecca having. Wow. You got another slide for me? Where are you at in this process before we complete this consummation? Where are you living? Are you living in the commencement? Are you living in the commitment? Are you in the consummation? Friends, I want to submit to you this morning. You are living solely in the commitment. Betrothed to the one who's coming. And that's the reason that the Holy Spirit picks on you about every single commitment in your life. Because the only thing matters for those who are betrothed to him is will you be committed? Will you be committed to your job? Will you be committed to the word that you gave that person? Will you be committed? Committed, 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 committed. Are you fully engaged? As I was just speaking to you about the consummation and the coming of the king, you started to hear scriptures that you are very familiar with in that process at his coming. Many of you are very familiar with the coming of Yeshua himself. Not all of us are really familiar with what it looks like. I'm going to close out with you on that, and I'm going to put some scriptures up on the screen that I'm going to leave up because there are a lot for you to study as we move forward and we close out this message. But let me ask you something. Where are you at in the process? You're committed. This is where you're going to have to learn how to kiss it, saints. Your entire life is about being committed. We live saying that we are married but the table of the marriage supper of the Lamb will only be filled with the faithful. Those who show up at the altar, those who get cold feet, don't show up there. And that responsibility is on you. Your groom will not drag you to the altar. The Lamb will have a willing bride, the Lamb will have a committed bride. Who is excited to be there? At his coming, he begins the time of the consummation. The Nesween process begins at his coming. He exposes the false bride at his coming. He defeats those who despise his coming at his coming. He imprisons Satan as his coming, at his coming. And he begins to set a table for his wedding, watch this, in Jerusalem, while the nations watch, and as he brings peace to those that he has caused to kiss the ring at his coming, and he teaches them a hard lesson in what it really looks like to kiss the sun. The slide behind me has several scriptures that I want you to study when you leave this place. But at the consummation, Revelation 14, 14 says, he comes on the clouds like a conquering king. Revelation 1, 13 says, with wedding garments dipped in blood. Revelation eleven fifteen 15 says, at the last blast of the shofar to remain on the earth forever. Matthew 24, 36 says, at a time only the father knows. Matthew 25, 1 through 7, but the bride must be ready and watching with plenty of oil. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 says, because the bridegroom comes at a surprising time during the darkest of night that everyone's going to say is blessed. But he says it's time. And 1 Thessalonians 4, 14 says, but those who have trimmed their wicks will be quickly taken away to meet him in the air at the resurrection, at the resurrection, at the time of his coming. Revelation 19, 6 says, only to be ushered, this is very important, 
away, not to heaven, but rather to the bridegroom's home in Jerusalem, where preparations for the wedding supper of the Lamb will begin. And we receive our new heavenly bodies wrapped in fresh white linen. And the lamb will begin to receive our new heavenly bodies. And we will begin to receive him. Revelation 21, 1 through 5. And we will begin our new eternal lives at home in Jerusalem, the center of the new heavens and the new earth. Revelation 21, 9, where the spirit and the bride and the father and the son all are together and saying, come. Verse 17, and the anthem will be, come and see the new Jerusalem, the city of our God, where there's no more tears and no more pain. And the lamb of God and, her bri- and his bridegroom dwells together. And the kingdom of our God will become the kingdom of men at the consummation of the eschaton, the beginning of all things. Wow. I want to close with this because that closing answer got you thinking future, but I want to bring it back to you for a minute. My whole aim here this morning was to correct some order in your thinking so that you might know that You're not living as married. You are betrothed, and the betrothal process is a commitment. And the reason that you're challenged every single day on your commitments is because you are the bride of Christ in waiting for the marriage supper of the Lamb, and the way that you act says something. Are you committed or are you not? I want to challenge you with this one this morning as we close. I was reading through uh, current Jewish law. Listen to how they treat this. In current Jewish law, as far as divorce is concerned, if a woman wants a divorce and the man during the betrothal process actually gives it to her, because it's justified because she was unfaithful at some point. He still had to marry her. And then after the marriage, give her the divorce that was justified and sorry, and she asked for. Why? That makes absolutely no sense in my mind. Because the husband... You would never be able to go back and say the husband did not finish what he started. And the husband will not ever be said that he backed out on the commitment he once made. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, not everyone who calls me husband will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did I not prophesy in your name? Did I not take on your name? Or cast out demons in your name? And do many works in your name? Did I not carry your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of Torahlessness. Lawlessness. They're at the marriage supper of the Lamb or beyond. When he says this, they got to their destination. And when they got there, the conclusion was different than they thought. I thought I was the bride. I'm sorry, read Revelation. There's a whore and there's a bride. And it's the big issue at the time of his coming. What's the difference between a whore and a bride? One sells herself for great gain, and the other keeps herself pure and waiting for his coming. 2 Timothy 2.8. It's our last scripture. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. The word of God is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect 
that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. And if we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. Wow. That's called an open door back at any time. The altar remains open for those who actually want to follow through on their commitment. Stand with me this morning. We call ourselves the bride and rightfully so. But when we do so, it's a prophetic declaration that we plan to follow through on our commitment. Once you are betrothed and receive the invitation and say yes, there's no more negotiating. You are going to show up at the altar. That is how your attitude should be. It's how your heart should be. It's how your life should live. And I want you to think about that as your pastor. I want you to think about that on every commitment in your life, whether it's to your job or whether it's to your friend, whether it's to your marriage, whether it's to this church, whether it is to the promises that you've made to God. I want you to think about it on every single level, small and large. Are you a man and woman of your commitment? Can somebody count on your word? If you say it, you should complete it. If you put it into action, you should finish it. Somebody should be able to rely on the bride of Christ because we reflect our bridegroom and we have the opportunity between what the time that this started and the time of his coming to actually show this world the promise that he's given to us is the promise that he'll give to them and you can trust him. But how can they if they can't see him? They can because they can see his bride. Mighty God, make us people of our commitment and make our commitments, Lord God, true.